The M4 Mac Mini has caused quite a stir, and with a very good reason. It's a brilliant Mac. I'm loving using it. Possibly there's even an argument to say that it's the best Mac pound for pound that Apple has ever made. But as good as it is though, it's causing some confusion. Why are folks confused? Well, they're thinking, will this Mac be good enough for me if it's the only Mac that I'm going to use, if it's the sole Mac that I'm going to buy? I get it. Can something this small, this compact, this tiny, can it really handle a good heavy workload? The people that are looking to buy a Mac Mini aren't the same people that are looking at iMacs and MacBook Airs. No, the people looking at the Mac Minis, particularly the Mac Mini Pros, they're coders, designers, creatives. They need to buy a machine that they know is going to handle whatever they can throw at it. So the idea of this video is to help declutter your brain. If you've had, and I know a lot of you have had a Mac Mini in the cart for days and weeks now thinking, should I hit buy? Or maybe look for an elusive bargain, maybe look for a MacBook Pro from a couple of years ago with a slightly better chip in it. By the end of this video, hopefully I'm going to have cleared your brain and you're going to know which route you should go. If this is the first of my videos you've seen, my name's David and I make videos about Apple gear every single week here on the channel, all Apple gear. Why? Well, I love using it, I spend my day using it, and more importantly, I love chatting to you about it. The success of the M4 Mac Mini and M4 Apple Silicon really is based on the success of its predecessor, in particular I mean the M1 Apple Silicon Macs from a few years ago. When Apple Silicon was first announced in November 2020, I remember writing a piece saying this is a once in a generation thing, the switch from Intel to Apple Silicon has changed everything. Seamless power, no fan noise, and of course on laptops you've got all day battery life. But Apple, they've done it all over again. The jump from M1 to M4 is huge. We are seeing massive performance boosts, not dissimilar to what we saw from going from Intel to Apple Silicon for the first time. Later on, I'll let you know what Mac I'm using. Is it an M1 Max MacBook Pro or is it an M4 Mac Mini? But first, let's look at the choices and find out why are they so confusing. I've made a few videos about the Mac Mini, and when I go through the comments to those videos, and there's been a lot, there's one recurring question that keeps coming up. Is the M4 Mac Mini Pro really for me? Is it as good as I'm hearing, or should I look for that elusive bargain that possibly doesn't even exist? If we compare the M4 Mac Mini Pro to the only other Mac that's got the Pro chip in it at the moment, which is a MacBook. Let's look at the 14-inch MacBook Pro, which starts at £1,999 or £2,000. You get 512 gigs of storage and 24 gigs of memory. The same Mac Mini with those same specs is going to cost you £1,399. So on the face of it, there's a bargain to be had, right? On the face of it, it's a £600 saving. But of course, don't forget, stating the obvious, you only get the Mac for that price. But then this is where things start to get a little bit confusing. You could go away and look at, say, the Mac that I've got, a 2022 M1 Max MacBook Pro. Is that a viable option? You're getting a Max chip, which surely has got to be better than the Pro chip, right? I mean, on eBay at the moment, I couldn't find the exact machine I've got, but something similar is going to be around about £1,500. So there's a savings to be made. But how does that Max chip, that older Max chip, compare with the brand new Pro chip. That was something I couldn't get my head around when I was trying to decide what Mac Mini Pro I should buy. And it's not as straightforward as you would think. On the face of it, one's a laptop, one's a desktop. But even there, the lines tend to get a little bit blurred. So what we're going to do now is go through the two machines that I've got here, the two machines that I use on a daily basis, pull them apart, look for the pros, cons, and strengths of each, and see if we can get to the bottom of whether you should be buying an M4 Pro Mac Mini right now. So this M1 Max MacBook Pro was my first taste of Apple Silicon. I remember deliberating for ages and ages deciding what spec to get. I was coming from a 2015 27-inch iMac, and it's still the Mac I've got most affinity to, the most love for, and worked in it for about five or six years solid. For some reason, me and that Mac, we just go back a long way together. But I knew it was time to change. I started this channel, video editing on it was a nightmare. A 10 minute 4K video was taking about 45 minutes to export, which seems ridiculous now. But even away from video editing, it was just starting to creak on big Photoshop files or .psb files. It was just showing its signs of age. So I knew I had to do something. So I decided to really spec it up and buy myself a good M1 Max MacBook Pro that was gonna see me into the future. I went with 32 gigs of unified memory. Do you remember when Apple Silicon first came out, just going down memory lane for a second, how that little number 32 sounded wrong compared to the numbers we used to hear with Intel Max? Well, anyway, I remember that very clearly thinking, is 32 gonna be enough? 32 was more than enough. And I think the only box I could have gone higher than that was 64 gigs of memory, but I went with 32. The M1 Max chip, as I say, it had a 24 core GPU and a 10 core CPU with eight performance cores 
and to efficiency cores. Now, storage, I had four terabytes of storage on there, which is way too much for me. I wanted a little bit of headroom. In an ideal world, I would have gone for two terabytes because of the kind of work I do. But when I was looking around, I could not find a MacBook M1 Max MacBook Pro with two terabytes of storage on that was going to be available within the next two or three months. The only one I could find in the UK had four terabytes on. So I kind of bit my lip and decided, okay, I was going to buy it. And it's been a great machine. It's got that beautiful Liquid Retina XDR display on. The only thing is I would say now that is starting to show its signs of age as well. If I need a second display, to be honest, my iPad Pro has got a better display on it. The, the MacBook Pro only goes to 500 nits of brightness and it's starting just to look a little bit dated. I know they've improved that on the new MacBook Pros, but they're kind of out of our price range in this video when we're comparing up against the new Mac Mini Pros. But I haven't got a complaint to make. This M1 Max MacBook Pro has been my workhorse six days a week for the last two years and it's never missed a beat. Anything I've thrown at it, no matter how complex the timelines in Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro when I used to use it, Audition, no matter what I'm doing, Photoshop, Lightroom, it just doesn't miss a beat. It's a brilliant machine. Now, I did tick a lot of boxes, as I said, and back in, I think it was April or May of 2020, I spent £3,425 on it. It's an eye-watering amount of money, but equally, if I think of the amount of money that I've made from it in using it for those past few years, it is the right decision. But this is partly the problem that Apple has caused themselves. Apple Silicon is just too good. Without a doubt, if I wasn't running this channel and reviewing Macs, I wouldn't be sitting here working thinking, oh, I need to change this M1 Max MacBook Pro. It's uh, beginning to slub and show signs of age. It's not. I swear to you, it's virtually as good as the day I got it. It is a brilliant machine. And that's a problem that Apple's got to face. You know, no matter which Mac you choose, the one week link is always the cameras. I've never been happy with any of them. And I've spent ages looking for a quality solution. This Obspot Me Too 4K webcam has blown my mind, not just how good it is, but with the AI powered feature that it packs and how simple it is to set up and use. The Me Too is perfect for gamers, live streamers, creators, and anyone who needs a quality online camera with an easy setup and seamless integration. It comes in three fresh contemporary colors, Aurora Green, Cloud White, and this Space Gray color. And although, as you can see, it's super, super compact, it's mighty 4K imaging technology, along with those advanced AI features, will guarantee you perfect video quality every time. Its unique AI auto framing algorithm means whether you're alone on a call or with multiple people, you'll always be in the perfect position. Meet 2 has a wide field of view as well that will keep you in frame in both landscape and portrait orientations while capturing more of your surroundings, helping your videos look more natural. It has these really neat hand gestures that let you lock or unlock the target focus and even zoom in and out. Perfect if, like me, you work alone. The video quality is unmatched. I've never seen results this good from any other webcam. You can shoot in either 4K 30, which is what I'm shooting here, or in 1080p 60 FPS. But no matter which you choose, the Meet 2 will give you rich, bright, vivid colors, helping bring your content to life with razor sharp detail. And Meet 2, has this other really cool AI feature called phase detection autofocus, which simply put means whether you're showing an object or moving around the room, the crazy fast autofocus will always keep you crisp and sharp. The half inch sensor and f1.8 aperture means even if you don't have perfect lighting, you'll still look great. Ozbot has class leading noise cancelling mics that deliver stunning audio and saves you the hassle and cost of setting up expensive mics and mic stands. So knowing that I was going to be chatting to Alex about Ozbots has been the highlight of my day. Alex, how are you keeping? Good, good. Yeah, also testing the Ozbot. Uh, I've got a tiny two light with me here. So Nice. I'm using the Me Too at the moment, but again, being really impressed with it. It's so easy to set up. I love the desktop controls you've got as well. You can be complete yeah. control of it, can't you? And again, like me, I know you work alone. The way you can turn things on and off, like the, the zooming in and the autofocus, you working alone, these cameras are brilliant, aren't they? And we're both yeah. using the mics on the cameras as well, right? I'm certainly using the mic on my end. The mic on this is actually really good as well. There's some processing in there, and you do have a, a if you like, you've been in a cafe or whatever. I actually took this um, traveling with me before. But yeah. yeah, you will yeah. remove some uh, audio. It does some processing as well if you want to. Again, for you and I, it's really useful. I did a product shot yesterday, you know, where it can focus up on a product shot and then it'll really mm. focus on you again very quickly. It's just so clever the way yeah. it works. Yeah, there's a little bit of focus breathing there, but it looks quite natural actually. Any, any camera will do that anyway. And one of the Meet 2's USPs is that you can unbox it and be online in minutes. I mean, literally minutes with its simple plug and play setup. But if you want to get the best out of this camera, then download the Obspot Center app. In there, you can play with everything from white balance, noise cancelling, the retouch tools, and bokeh settings. And when you're done, simply attach this magnetic clip to ensure your privacy is protected. It's simple, 
ingenious, and I love it. And with Christmas and the holiday season just around the corner, Obspot has got your back. From the 16th of December through to Christmas Day, Obspot will be announcing an exclusive discount stack, which means you could save up to 20%. And guess what? I'll leave all of those details for you in the description. All the gear you see me review on this channel, I buy. I say that only because it means that I spec it just as carefully as you. It's nothing frivolous about it. I'm buying these Macs to keep and to use. I'm not one of those YouTubers that goes and buys something and returns it. So it was the same with this M1 Max MacBook Pro. I spec that very carefully. The iPad Pro during the summer, and certainly when it came to this M4 Mac Mini Pro, we were hearing that this M4 Apple Silicon in a three nanometer architecture was gonna be something impressive, and it has been, which set me to thinking, well, maybe I could actually replace my M1 Max MacBook Pro with this newer Mac Mini. I didn't know if that was gonna be a foolish errand or not, but I wanted to give it a fair shot, so I ticked a lot of boxes. I've got a one terabyte SSD in there. It's got the M4 Pro chip in there with the upgraded chip, 14 core CPU, 20 core GPU, and I've got 48 gigs of memory in there as well. Oh, and I've even got the 10 gig ethernet port just in case I decide I want to use that in the future. All of that cost me 2,300 pounds. But again, of course, don't forget, all you get is that Mac. But all I can honestly tell you is after two or three weeks of using these two Macs side by side is that the performance has proven to be ever, ever so close. So, what should the choices come down to if it's not purely on performance? Buying a used Mac is always going to be a risk. When you buy a new Mac, you know you're buying it direct from Apple. You're the first person to box an unused. You know all of its history. When you're buying a used Mac, you don't get that same peace of mind. You're going to need good quality peripherals, clearly, if you're buying the M4 Mac Mini. Now, you might already have those, but again, it's the kind of Mac, if you're buying this to do high-end creative work on, you're going to want a good display, a good mouse, a good trackpad, a good keyboard. So you've got to bear that in mind as well. It's important what your workflow is. Would an older, possibly, M1 Max MacBook Pro be good enough for you? Or do you need the potentially better performance that's gonna come from this newer three nanometer architecture? And portability, it's odd I know talking about portability when in theory I'm talking about a desktop up against a laptop. But I'm gonna come back to that because the MacBook Pro isn't quite as portable as you might think. The fact that the M1 Max MacBook Pros are now that much more affordable, used and secondhand, makes things even more confusing, and I totally get it. When I was looking to buy this M4 Pro Mac Mini, I couldn't get it through my head. Could a Pro chip possibly be better than a Max chip? Although the Pro chip was brand new, the Max chip was two, three years old, we kept hearing this three nanometer architecture was gonna be the big difference. I was confused. I didn't wanna sacrifice my speed or productivity. I want a machine that's gonna get me through my work as quick as possible. So then for the first time ever, I decided to do some benchmark tests to see if that would separate them. And even there, there was a tiny difference. The benchmark that's probably most important for you to hear about right now is a 10 minute, 12 minute, I think it was a 12 minute 4K video. I exported them on both machines from Final Cut Pro, exactly the same file. And the difference in export times from those two Macs was seven seconds. So even that didn't help me decide which machine was gonna be better. Roughly speaking, a well-specced M4 Mac Mini Pro is gonna cost the same as about a two-year-old M1 Max MacBook Pro of similar specs. So convenience, is it convenience that's important to you to have a Mac that has got everything all in one body? If that's the case, obviously you've got to go with the MacBook Pro. But that still makes me wonder, is there such a thing as a bargain? And if you're enjoying these videos that I bring you every week here on the channel, all about Apple gear, all Apple gear, there's one thing you can really do to help me out. As I said, I buy all this gear myself, so I really need your help and love to help this channel grow into 2025. And you know what I'm gonna say, subscribe. Just reaching down, hitting that subscribe button makes a big difference. And assuming that you're enjoying these videos that you're watching each week, and a lot of you seem to be coming back to watch them, 90% of you still aren't subscribed. Honestly, I can't tell you the difference that makes. Just subscribing helps this channel grow, and the quicker it grows, the more videos I can bring you, the more gear I can get, the more gear I can test for you, and the more videos I can make. So if you're enjoying the videos, just show me that little bit of love. I still got this dream of getting to 15,000 subs by the end of the year. We started at barely 3,000, so it's been great growth this year, but now I've got my eye on the next target, 15,000. Come on team, you can help me out. Let's do this, let's help this channel grow by the end of the year. 15,000 subs would mean the world to me. So which Mac am I using? I've got two Macs sitting here, and which one have I reached for? Well, this week, I've actually made the switch. Everything I've done this week, and I mean everything, has been done on the M4 Pro Mac Mini. That's included video editing, that's included Lightroom work, Photoshop work, podcast editing, and even working in InDesign. The shorts I make using CapCut, everything you can think of has been done on the Mac Mini. I've now hooked up my monkey dock to it, so I've got all the ports I could possibly need. Literally everything I've done this week has been done off of the Mac Mini. And I've not missed the MacBook Pro in the slightest. In fact, I liked it so much, 
and was enjoying using it so much. And I can see it's going to be my Mac into the future. I went and spent more money this weekend. I got myself a new USB-C keyboard, mouse and trackpad. The keyboard just feels actually nicer to use. It's better balanced. It feels more responsive and it's got touch ID. So I went and spent more money on those peripherals because I know that this is going to be the Mac that I'm going to be using into the future. It just feels indefinably quicker, snappier. Now, it could be the Emperor's new clothes. It could be a case it's a new toy, but I don't think it is. Apps seem to open and close quicker. Even silly things like AirDrop seems to work more consistently and first time and quicker. Things like iPhone mirroring are easier to use. All of this new OS we're getting just works better on the newer technology, which kind of makes sense. I was concerned about the storage, only having one terabyte of storage on here, but I use Dropbox Sync for most of my work, so storage hasn't been an issue. I've got everything I need on here at the moment, and I'm nowhere near that terabyte, nowhere near. The only time it balloons is during the week when I'm editing these videos. I always edit the videos locally from the desktop, and as you know, if you use Final Cut Pro, these files can balloon pretty quickly, but the moment it's done and uploaded, I archive it all. So I think one terabyte actually is going to be plenty. And if I find myself struggling for storage, we know that this has got Thunderbolt 5 on it, which is lightning quick. Okay, there's only a few very expensive Thunderbolt SSDs around, Thunderbolt 5 SSDs around at the moment, but they're going to become more and more commonplace. And also the prices will come down. And as for memory, honestly, I have not noticed a difference between 32 and 24 gigs of memory. This 24 gigs has never struggled. I had one beach ball once when I was putting some 3D graphics onto a Final Cut timeline, but that has been it. In two, three weeks of using it, honestly, these things are amazing. So which should you buy? It really is as simple as I've mentioned earlier on this video. If having an all-in-one body is really important to you, then sure, go with a MacBook Pro. Buy an older used M1 Max MacBook Pro and just hope it's had a good previous life. They are fantastic machines. But don't be put off by portability. This Mac Mini Pro is portable, probably more portable than the M1 Max MacBook Pro. I hardly ever take it out of the studio because it's so damn heavy. And don't forget, all the time you're moving it around, it's a risk. It has got that liquid XDR panel on there. You're moving a high-end display around as well. It's not something I like to do that often. You can put this Mac Mini keyboard and mouse in a backpack with a power cord and you're done, assuming of course that you've got a display wherever you're going. Honestly, don't be put off by thinking this isn't portable. It's every bit as portable as a MacBook Pro. The improvements in M4 Apple Silicon are frightening and honestly, they're good enough for me to say hand on heart. If you're thinking between buying a brand new M4 Pro Mac Mini or an older M1 Max MacBook Pro, unless that body and having everything in one body is really important to you, go for the newer machine for so many reasons. You've got all the manufacturer's warranties on it and it's brand new technology. It just seems quicker and faster. The fact we've still got M4 Ultra to come next year, it's mind boggling. I don't know who's gonna need it, I really don't, but this M4 Pro Mac Mini has been the answer to my dreams. I am loving using it. It's given me a new lease of life. A little bit earlier on, you heard me mention that video that I made talking about benchmarks. It's on screen right now and there's some really interesting content in there that I think you might just enjoy.